A massive thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. The first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a two month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Remember when QuickTime events were the scourge of the games industry, in the same way that generic greeny brown cover shooters and motion controls once were? There was a point in time around the late 2000s and early 2010s where seemingly every game had them and every review slated them. The QuickTime event in most games was, and is, a means of allowing developers to illustrate spectacle beyond what the mechanics of their game allow for, giving players the chance to soar above and tackle beasts of a scale beyond normal comprehension, but they do so by drastically limiting what actual control the player has over the action, in many cases reducing their input to guess the button press in order to keep a cutscene moving. In games such as this, it seems like the more daunting the task, the simpler the means of overcoming it actually actually are. And for sure, this feels like a decidedly quaint issue by today's standards, but it's one that dominated many discussions of games back in the day. And it's this context that has made revisiting 2012's Asura's Wrath, a collaboration between Capcom and CyberConnect2, all the more intriguing a process all these years later. In an era where derision of QuickTime events reigned supreme, here we have a game that doubled down on this divisive control method where QuickTime events weren't limited to the occasional cutscene but would characterise the majority of your playthrough. Asura's Wrath was widely heralded for the jaw-dropping, universe-spanning scale of its wildly over-the-top encounters, as well as its unique TV show style of presentation, but saw critics decry the simplicity, the rigidity of how it all played out, leaving many to deem it to this day as little more than an interactive anime, a title more fun to watch than to actually play. And yet, booting it up recently, I find myself in almost total disagreement with that notion. For me personally, this game is an absolute blast to control. Far from the more cynical applications of quick time events in bigger budget games that most of the time feel like they just want to show off some kind of graphical fidelity, there's a commitment to quick time events as an aesthetic choice in Asura's Wrath. A baseline that this is going to form the mechanical meat of their game, that very much uses the language of games to communicate that intent, and that allows the developers to make those button prompts as satisfying and meaningful as possible, tying those very prompts and the ensuing chaos into the game's themes in order to tell a story that intrigues beyond its bombast, coming across as way more clever than its seemingly simple plot might let on. Indeed, as this frenzied tale of revenge plays out, with Asura going after the demigods who betrayed him, killed his wife and kidnapped his daughter, you'd be forgiven on first glance for thinking that our hero doesn't really seem to have much of an arc in the traditional sense. As the title suggests, he is indeed angry at everyone and everything he comes across, right up until the very end of the game. Sometimes he's bitter too, both traits you wouldn't normally associate with a particularly likeable character. That said, as I played, I couldn't help but find Asura's propensity for fisticuffs rather charming. Asura's is a rage that only becomes more righteous as the literal millennia pass, as he climbs step by step out of hell and the punishment bestowed upon him and by extension the world around him by these prideful, arrogant demigods only grows in severity and unfairness. All Asura can do is continue to frantically fight against it. It's all he knows, it's a pretty negative emotion to boot, and somehow, in this instance, embracing that fact feels like the only way for Asura Asura to make things right. This is because, similar to last year's Sekiro, Asura's Wrath actually utilises its Buddhist imagery as a key thematic component of its story. And it might be the thing that turns Asura from mere angry man into a surprisingly rich character. And it's all in that name. And unfortunately this does require me to attempt to condense an entire spiritual structure into a couple of paragraphs, so bear with me here. In extremely broad terms, Asura is, well, Asura, a demigod which, despite the obvious power they display, is a realm of existence below that of an actual god, thanks to the Asura's propensity for anger and other such negative traits. One might even consider this realm lesser than the human realm, as lacking this negative baggage, humans possess a greater potential to escape the cycle of death and rebirth as per the Buddhist tradition and achieve nirvana. And the way this all bears itself out in game is in the form of a wildly heightened identity crisis. Asura is tormented 
represented by others like him, demigods who are willing to destroy everything around them to achieve some kind of superficial power or status. Asura's resilience in his anger, on the other hand, his inability to be swayed in his attempts to batter everyone in his path, and his adamant refusal to be worshipped as his former cohorts so violently demand of humanity, ironically becomes the thing that grounds him, setting him apart from his more aspirational foes. As such, Asura's wrath ends up as a surprisingly complex, harrowing, and ultimately bittersweet tale of someone coming to terms with, and at times embracing their own anger, rather than completely ridding themselves of it as a more traditional narrative might dictate. It's the story of a man trying desperately to find some justice for the wrongs and hardships inflicted upon him, those he cares about, upon the world and the natural order of things, only for some new, bigger, more abstract barrier to be placed in front of him at every step, throwing Asura further into confusion the angrier he gets. If there's a larger thematic question the game asks, it's this, just how do you achieve karmatic justice in a world that so quickly moves beyond your understanding of it? Whew. The thing is though, it's precisely this dilemma that makes the game's very real sense of humour that much more enjoyable. That balance of real, torturous pain inflicted by truly evil forces upon someone who doesn't deserve it, and the fact that no matter how absurd or abstract this world becomes, Asura has one answer for it all. That is, without a hint of consideration or hesitation, simply punch it harder, punch it more. In the same way that Devil May Cry revels in taking the grandeur of the dark fantasy genre and cheekily slicing it down to size, it's hilarious to see a cosmic being in the middle of some hugely dramatic or pompous speech, only for you to hit the circle button and bring an end to it with something as simple as a fist to the face. Which finally brings us onto this game's combat, which, like the story, I feel gets a bad rap. Contrary to popular belief, the game is not actually all quick time events. In fact, a good deal of your time with Asura's Wrath places you more or less in full control of the titular angry man. As he runs around in closed arenas or along paths taking part in beat em up style combat or shmup sections. It controls like a regular brawler with boss battles and everything. One button for light attacks, another for heavy, another for dodging. It's far from the most complicated brawler in the world, its camera and the occasional glitch can leave it all feeling a little awkward at times but these sections are still fairly satisfying in the same way that Dynasty Warriors games can often be. And what's more, these boss battles can actually end up requiring a good deal more than mashing, as complicated patterns require some pretty precise timing to overcome. Sure, it's all simply in service of filling up a bar to hit that burst meter, but once you do, that's when the real magic of Asura's Wrath comes to the fore. This is where the game's much lauded spectacle is fully on show, where simple brawls with fodder enemies suddenly evolve into sequences where a sword can drive you from the moon right through the Earth's core, where a flurry of punches can drastically alter a planet's very structure. And even though on the surface it looks like a movie is just playing out, every aspect of Asura's explosive movement requires some kind of input from the player, and importantly, one that's consistent with the way you controlled the brawler section that preceded it. Something as simple as mapping the quick time events to the buttons you'd normally press to carry out those actions elevates the game above the Simon says approach you'd see in many other titles. You're still hitting the light attack to bombard your enemy with rapid blows before finishing them off with a well-timed Y heavy attack to smash them in the face or throw them across the galaxy. You're positioning your feet in a way that allows you to brace for the sheer force you are about to rain down upon your enemy. You're made to hit that button as hard as you goddamn can for sustained, sometimes punishing periods of time, so you can really feel that delightfully anime sensation where a punch is already connected but somehow you're still driving your energy through it, the actions you're required to carry out map so intuitively to what is happening on screen, while also taking into account things like player eye lines and how characters manoeuvre themselves to ensure that a button press is never an abstract guessing game. There's never the scenario where you're too busy focusing on what commands to enter to pay attention to the chaos it's all supposed to be causing. There's a clarity to everything here that allows you to bask in the action on screen, while remaining fully aware of what you might be expected to to do next. Indeed, rather than in other games where these instances are a move away from more tactically satisfying play, here the quick time event is a perfectly crafted tool to emphasise the power of every punch thrown. The points at which you control the game quote unquote normally, with freedom of movement and strategy, often feel roped in comparison to what follows it. The context changes between every cutscene, and sure, you can't really lose in these sections, but it's all so consistent with how you control the game normally that it doesn't feel like you're 
you're shifting away to some wildly uninteractive form of play. Rather, the game is using regular beat-em-up button layouts in order to place you more directly in control of the insane narrative playing out in front of you. This is the quick time event as an art form, it's the ideal of what the concept is supposed to represent in my eyes, and I really struggle to think of any game that utilises it to this level of effectiveness. What can I say, it just feels damn good to control this mad anime. And it's for these reasons that I've found myself disagreeing with a lot of pieces I've seen on this game that say just to watch a playthrough of Asura's Wrath rather than play it yourself. Admittedly, there's a lot getting in the way of that, with the rigmarole of navigating just which DLC you need in order to get the completely necessary true ending to the game, which led to a weird scenario in which said DLC cost as much as the full game I bought on eBay, DLC pricing is wild, that said, I do believe there is something you miss out on, a ferocity that you don't fully experience when that punch Asura throws lacks your frenzied button presses propelling. Even in the small crowd of quick time driven cinematic games, Asura's Wrath stands out as a remarkably singular experience that I think deserves far more credit as both a story and a real tactile video game than it ever actually got. One in which getting the full glorious picture of this utterly insane adventure is only truly possible when that controller is in your hand. And speaking of taking control into your own hands, why not take control of your personal growth with today's sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions and get lost in creativity with Skillshare's inspiring online classes on topics including illustration, photography, video, design and more. Speaking of design, why not check out Learn Photoshop, fundamentals for getting started with Kat Coquelette. Photoshop is a really important tool for so many creatives, but it can be pretty daunting when you start it up. This step-by-step -step guide breaks everything down in a super simple, relaxing way that will handily prepare you to tackle any creative ideas you might have. And what's more, Skillshare offers classes designed for real life and all the circumstances that come with it. These lessons can help you stay inspired, express yourself and introduce you to a community of millions, all for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. And because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, the first thousand people who click my link in the description can get a two month free trial of premium membership, so there's no risk to checking it out for yourself and you'll really be helping the channel in the process. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and I hope you all enjoyed this piece about Asura's Wrath. I'd like to sincerely thank my patrons here, it's your continued support during this weird time that is precisely what allows me to keep making videos and I could never thank you enough for that. If you can, and only if you feel like you can, you can really help the channel continue as well as get things like early access to ad-free video uploads by heading to patreon.com slash writing on games and pledging only what you feel comfortable with. I am immensely grateful for your support in whatever form it takes. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Artyom Vitsu, Kalea Cinello, Constantino Sakinis, Henry Milek, Edward Clayton Andrews, Hibia Mori, Rob, Bryce Snyder, Tommy Carver Chaplin, David Bjork, Lucas, Dallas Keen, William Fielder, My Dad, Timothy Jones, The Nameless Guy, Ham Migas, Samuel Pickens, Shardfire, Anna Pimentel, Justin Solderness, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching, stay home, wash those hands, and I will see you all next time.